Welcome once again to the Noonday Bible Class at Community Baptist Church in Santa Rosa, California, where our pastor is Reverend Dr. H. Lee Turner. My name is Brother James Kennedy. And Sister Maria Dreyer is the one who types these lessons so he can follow along with us. So we thank you for that. We end session three, the temptation to test God. Uh, scripture will be, uh, passage will be from Deuteronomy 6, 16 through 25 and Matthew 4, 5 through 7. Uh, we start off with, uh, we want um, those, uh, we want to pray for those in the sick and shut in and on our prayer list. We want to pray for the sick and shut in, Lori and Barbara Johnson, Hank and Ann Des Jordan, Lanita Marie Johnson, Jacqueline Kemp, Harvey Johnson, Nick Carter, Deacon Barnum Duncan, Joseph Hampton, Ken and Virginia Sanders, Kim Burgess, Annette Jones, J.J. Bonavito, Evelyn Cunningham, Georgia Payton, Eloise Oliver, Bonnie Harris, Sharon Rockstead, Michael Peterson Jr., Beverly Combs, Traverse Collins, uh, Leah Beaton, and uh, Michael Gibson. We pray for our pastor, Reverend Dr. H. E. Thorner, for strength and endurance and uplifting. We pray for our CBC staff, Sister Mary, Mary Steyer and Brother Jim Kennedy, ministers, Reverend Francis, Reverend Parker, and Reverend Sims. Auxiliary ministries, teachers, and church family. We pray for Sister Susan Field, the healing uh, of her hip from a uh, fall. The Dietrich and Edward family for strength and comfort. Brother Donald Woodward Jr. for wisdom and guidance. Sister Metsy Valera uh, for continuous recovering from a stroke. Wentworth family at the loss of Walter Keith Wentworth. Wentworth. Sister Lenny Foster for continuous healing from brain surgery. Willie and Green for blessing and direction, the Thomas family at the loss of John Thompson, the sister Crystal Oliver, Oliveris, and family for salvation and renewal, and brother Vince uh, Kappas for a continuous healing from car accident. We also pray for all those prayers, best out those to people that's going to be watching, and uh, we lift them up. Do you have any father? Um, so we'll start off with scripture and then have prayer. I'll be reading Psalms 103, this New King James Version. Uh, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. I bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercy, who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his way to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt, he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquity. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy to those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgression from us. As the Father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame, and he remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass, as a flower in the field, so he flourished. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place remembered no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children. To such as keep his covenant and to those who remember his commandments to do them. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord ye, his angels who excel in his strength, who do his uh, word. 
he with the voice of his word that bless the Lord all you his host, you ministers of his who do his pleasure. Bless the Lord all his works in all places of his domain, and bless the Lord all my soul. May blessed be to the hearing and reading of Psalm 103. Amen. Follow our word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you today, thank you for this day that we've never seen before. We thank you for all you do for us day in and day out. Thank you for waking us up one more day and starting us on our way, Lord. And Lord, we pray for all those prayer requests that were mentioned to you, uh, that were lifted up to you today, Lord. We pray for those uh, out there who have prayer requests, Lord. We pray that you would answer them according to your will. And Lord, we pray for the Holy Spirit to minister to our hearts today through your word, that we may apply it to our lives and share it with others, Lord. Lord, uh, we should receive it in our hearts that transform our lives and uh, uh, to be more of, about your business, Lord. We thank you for being our God, Lord. We we'll give you the praise, honor, and glory always. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. So, um, this is session two, Psalm 103, Temptation to Test God. The point is, we, uh, we can trust God without putting him to the test. The passage is Deuteronomy 6, 16 through 25 and Matthew 4, 5 through 7. The Bible meets light. I was in, I was in elementary school when central air conditioning units were finally installed throughout my school. My family had, uh, had not uh, been in the United States very long and I couldn't speak English very well. I was new, but I always had a crush on a girl in my new class. For some reason, the idea came into my head to ask God for a sign so I could know if the girl liked me. The sign I chose because the air condition was on a thermostat. It would turn on and off automatic, so I wanted it to come on just at the moment I predicted. I closed my eyes, waited and waited and waited, and then predicted. I closed my eyes and waited and waited and waited, and I said, no. Nothing happened. Being determined, I tried again, and again, nothing happened. We can be tempted to do the same as adults and put God to the test. But uh, because God is faithful, we do not need to put him to the test. We simply need to trust him and ask him for what we need. Okay, the scripture of Matthew 4, 5 to 7. Then the devil takes him up into the holy city and sets him on the pinnacle of the temple and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give the angel charge concerning thee and in their hands, and they should bear thee up. At least any time thou dashed thy foot against the stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. He word of the Holy City, verse 5. This is clear reference to Jerusalem as the mention of the temple indicates in Luke version of the event. The city is specifically called Jerusalem, Luke 4 9. Pinnacle of the temple, verse 5. The pinnacle light refers in the flat top corner of Solomon's porch on the southeast corner of the temple complex. So now we'll be reading the commentary in Matthew uh, 5. And the devil takes him up into the holy city and set him in the pinnacle of the temple. Verse 5 follows the first temptation when Jesus resists Satan. With the word of God, the devil then brought Jesus to the holy city, Jerusalem, and to the pinnacle of the temple. This was likely the high flat top corner of Solomon's porch that sat on the southeast corner of the temple, complex and overlooked the Kindron Valley. Think of, think of it as a roof with a, a portico. Uh, where a huge restraining wall descending from its height above the Temple Mount, deep into the valley below. The ancient historian Josephus claimed the drop was more than 450 feet. 
verse 6, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He should give his angel charge concerning thee, and in their hands they should bear thee up, least at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. In verse 6, the second temptation was for Jesus to test God once again. The temptation was not uh, uh, predicated by Satan doubting who Jesus was. Rather, the devil challenged to Jesus was about the sort of Messiah he would be. In a sense, this was an appeal to pride and popularity. For Jesus could call down a display of a miraculous power that the people in the city would see if he wanted to. Uh, it built upon the first temptation. After all, if Jesus really was the Son of God, nothing could harm him. God, uh, God the Father would not allow it. The devil may well have been reminding Jesus of the prophecy in Malachi 3 1. The prophet predicted that the Lord would come dramatically to the temple. Satan was simply challenging the Lord to do what the people were already expecting. What harm would that cause? To further make the case, the devil took the page from Jesus' own playbook. He quoted scripture. After, uh, after all, seeing the effect it had when Jesus spoke from God's word, Satan apparently decided he would give it a try again. He would give it a try. Uh, he chose uh, Psalm 9, 91, 11, 12, which states, For he shall give his angels charge over thee, and keep thee in all thy ways. And they shall bear thee up in thy, their hands, at least thou dash thy foot against the stone. However, he intentionally omitted a phrase that is key to this verse, in all thy ways. The real danger was not in the omission itself, but in the misapplication of the passage. The Lord himself didn't call out the omission because what was the utmost importance was the promise. However, the psalmist was clearly teaching that a person is uh, protected only when he or she follows the will of God. The psalmist was alluding to a time when he stumbled and God promised to keep him from harm. In this broader application, it refers to those who trust God and have committed to walk in his ways. Such people will be lifted up by angels and cared for when they stumble. By omitting the key component of the verse, Satan was setting up a false equivalence between the psalmist stumbling and Jesus intentionally jumping off the pinnacle of the temple. For Jesus to, to do this in uh, some dramatic display to reconcile help himself with the people, people's belief would not have uh, been God's will. Jesus was being asked to test God's faithfulness and ultimately his position as son was by creating a situation that would require God to act in a certain way, would force him to intervene. This temptation is not uncommon today. Uh, we are constantly being manipulated by Satan to put God into a box when we expect him to act a certain way. We uh, metaphor metaphorically leap off the pedestal and then expect God to do something miraculous to rescue us. But the real miracle, miracle occurs when we trust God to act in ways consistent with his will and not our own. We will find him faithful uh, to fulfill all his promise. Amen. In verse 7, says, Jesus said unto them, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Jesus rejects the temptation and once again quotes scripture. This time in, uh, from Deuteronomy 6.16, his response was straightforward. It would not be right to tempt the Lord thy God and then expect him to bail you out when you are disobedient uh, his will. 
Jesus resists was not due to lack of confidence or either in the uh, uh, confidence was not due to lack of confidence in either himself or the father. He certainly could have suspended the force of gravity on the uh, general laws of aerodynamic and avert all, uh, any harm befalling Jesus. They could have commanded legions of angels to swoop in and rescue him mid fall. The power to do what he was being tempted to, to do was not in question. Even Satan knew the power he possesses along with the Father. Jesus refused to take matter into his own hand and came because the scripture forbid God to, uh, to the test. The original context of Deuteronomy 6.16 recalls the episode first recorded in Exodus 17. This was a time when the people of God rebelled against Moses and the Lord and the Messiah uh, Mac, uh, Rebelled against Moses and the Lord at Mas Maso. There the people argued with Moses and the man wanted to drink. Moses responded that they were ultimately testing God and not merely complaining to him, hence the naming of the place Maso, which means testing. The people respond by accusing Moses of being the instrument of his response. Telling him that he brought them out into the wilderness to die. Moses' frustration grew from the fact that the people had been relying on God's provision but neglecting to give him proper thanks. Instead, they turned to grumbling and complaining. In both cases, the Israelites and Jesus in the wilderness of temptation. The demands were for miraculous protection as proof that God cared. Instead, God's people are to be obedient and trust Him with all their hearts and minds. It also is important to learn from the text the necessary of knowing Scripture because there will be times when people twist the Bible in order to manipulate us in doing something contrary to God's Word. Okay, so then we'll go back to. Uh, our main uh, book here, and then we'll go here. And, uh, says, when we are afraid, we often long for God's presence and protection. Satan would like nothing more than use uh, those fears to undermine our faith in God. This is what Satan attempts with his second temptation directed at Jesus. When the first temptation, Satan tried to, in vain, to get Jesus to question God's provision. With his second temptation, Satan was tempting Jesus to question God's presence and protection. Forty days before this temptation, John the Baptist had baptized Jesus at that baptism. God the Father spoke audibly and declared, This is my beloved Son, in whom I well please. Matthew 13, 17. Jesus, uh, Jesus had no reason to doubt the Father and his care for him, but Satan was trying was going to try. Jesus responded to the first temptation by quoting scripture. Now Satan tried using scripture in his own advantage. Satan knows scripture well, and he knew Jesus had come to save people from their sins and bring them back to God. So Satan quoted from Psalms 91 and Psalms about God's protection over his people. This was not the first time Satan tried to manipulate the word from God. He did the same with Adam and Eve in the garden. He had God said that you should not eat of every tree in the garden, Genesis 3 1. Satan used God's word, but also distorts them. What Satan did with Adam and Eve, and Satan will do with us, manipulate and distort scripture. Satan used people to twist scripture and leads God's people astray. For such false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And uh, no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into angel life. Therefore, it is no great thing in his ministers also to be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. Whose end shall be according to their works in 2 Corinthians 11, 13, 15. 
To combat Satan, temptation, we must know Scripture well. Satan used Psalms 91, 11, and 12 to challenge Jesus to put God to the test. To make Jesus prove himself, if Jesus jumped off the top of the temple, which represents God's presence among his people, the Father would miraculously rescue him in front of all the people gathered there, and they would see clearly that he is the Messiah. If Jesus wanted to be recognized as the Messiah, this was a quick and easy way to make it happen. And then the question is, when would we be most tempted to test God? Probably when we were. I don't know. When we don't understand scripture, well, right there we might thank you. God doesn't protect his promise in Psalms 91, but we don't need to know it, uh, knowing put ourselves in harm's way to find, to force God to act. Jesus uh, did uh, need to test to prove God's faithfulness, nor would he shortcome the path laid out by his Father's will. Jesus didn't need a sign and needed to weep. When we unsure or even afraid of a decision before us, we are to pray and trust uh, the Lord to act as he deems best. But when we ask for a sign, we are simply saying, God, prove it to yourself. It exposes our unbelief. In uh, communication that God's word is not enough, we need something more. Jesus responds to this temptation by quoting scripture. In the next session, we will look closely at the passage Jesus quote. But Jesus acted on the command of Deuteronomy 6, not to test the Lord Jesus who didn't need to. Not to test the Lord, Jesus didn't need to. So he knew that God was with him. He didn't need to prove that to himself, and he wouldn't follow the Father's will and how he would reveal himself to others. And the question was, how have you seen Misapplication of scripture lead people astray. And then we'll go to uh, Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 19, and we'll go to our commentary. Uh, Keyword of Manasseh, verse 16. Manasseh was the location in Exodus where people quarreled with Moses about the lack of water in the desert. Manasseh means testing. Verse 16, it says, We should not tempt the Lord your God as he tempted him in Messiah. First section, the section further expounds and uh, crystallizes the covenant basis for Israel's behavior in Canaan. First, in verse 12, the people were commanded not to forget the Lord. Then, in verse 13 and 15, they were encouraged to keep the first two commandments. Now, in verse 16, Moses admonished them, We should not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Messiah. Test the Lord ref refers to the practice of placing demands or requirements on him that are inconsistent with his character or nature or are inappropriate for circumstances. Jesus quote of this text in Matthew 4 in response to Satan, Satan's temptation to throw himself from the pinnacle of the temple. As Manat and Messiah, the people argued with Moses about water. Moses responded by telling them they were all to make test of God and not just quarreling with him. The people then spoke Moses for bringing them out of Egypt and into the wilderness to die. Moses turned to the Lord and asked, What shall I do unto the people that they be almost ready to stone me? Exodus 17, 4. Then, then God provided water and mentioned above, Moses renamed the place Messiah. Because the people test God by demanding proof of his care and concern in the form of water drinking, they had a plea with God to provide water when God was the provision all along. It was a case of wrong motive and ambition. 
It pointed to situations where people were sitting at things even when they knew things were wrong. Jesus quote is first in Matthew 4 because jumping from the temple is a spectacular design to demonstrate God's power to all those watching below was wholly inconsistent with God's will. It would have been an attempt to force God into action. Sure, God could have rescued Jesus in just that by doing so under the condition God's power and love for his son would have been uh, fabulous. The children of Israel set up a condition at Mesdah in which they would only recognize God's presence with them and love for them if he jumped through a particular hoop they created. It was wrong and inconsistent with God's will. In a sense, they denied the Lord's presence and demand a miraculous demonstration to prove his concern for them. Today we are all into the same trap when the devil twists scripture, causing us to doubt the certain certainty of God and his word. The same test occurs when someone is tempted to set, set out of, on a business venture and lure of making big money supplements his or her trust in the Lord and obedience to his will. Verse 17, which says, You should diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes, uh, which he has commanded thee. Then next, Moses challenged the people to put their desires and ambitions into obeying the command of the Lord. The caution against testing the Lord was followed by a reference to the covenant obligation. They were to diligently keep the commandments and their testimonies and their statutes. The Hebrew word for shama could also be translated diligently keep. Moses, Moses uh, juxtaposed the situation with the people of Manasseh with an exploration to be diligent about walking in the Lord's will. The image was of a person so intended to keeping the Lord's commands that he studied the word and continuously asked whether or not what he planned to do is consistent with what the Bible teaches. There is an important distinction to be made. The Bible is not just a book to be studied, eh? but one to be studied with the attention of obeying you. Eh? We have no reason to doubt God or to put him through a necessary test. When we choose to trust and obey his word, this requires uh, an intentional lifestyle and aim and godliness and glorifying God. Yeah. It's not natural to put one trust completely in another. We are conditioned to look out for ourselves and not to trust anyone too much. A careful examination who reveals God as one who is worthy to receive all our trust because he has already proved himself many times. In verse 18 and 19, which reads, And thou shalt do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with thee, and that thou may go in and possess the good land which the Lord's way unto thy fathers, to cast out thy enemies, from before thee, as the Lord has spoken. Moses then further clarifies this line of reason by telling the Israelites to do that which is right and good. Right has generally been accepted to mean those things that are morally straight, upright, and innocent. Good means those things that are pleasing and desirable. Moses introduced a conditional aspect to an unconditional guarantee. They are to do what is good and right, so they may go in and possess the good land. 
which God had sworn to their fathers. The idea that if the people did what was right and good in the Lord, I, the consequence of Canaan and the dispositions of his current residence, would follow. Moses was teaching that if the Israelites did the right thing, that they could accomplish what God had already promised to them. So two things are at work here that might seem contradictory, but aren't. First, God originally promised to their forefathers was uh, annihilated and without condition. God had promised to land to them as it had already taken place. Second, subsequently, generations of Israelites could obtain those same blessings through faith and obedience. In other words, future generations could be required to walk in the covenant faithfulness in that they were to receive the covenant blessing. Faith, uh, failure to live up a devotional obligation to walk in faith and obedience would result in judgment and possible removal from Canaan. We can see this being played out throughout the Old Testament, particularly through the era of the judges. Okay, uh, and we'll read uh, from the book, uh, Deuteronomy 6, 6 to 19. Israel had no reason to put God to the test. So as God prepared the second generation to go into the promised land, he remembered them once again and his promise and provision. God would bring them into, uh, into the great and uh, uh, goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of all good things which thou fillest not, and wells big which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not, as Deuteronomy 6, 10 to 11. God promised all, all this to him, their parents, the first generation left Egypt for God's promised land, but they put God to the test because they failed to believe. The Lord reminded them one, once a such moment in their history, which they had encamped and referred them on their way to Mount Sinai, uh, Exodus 17, 1 to 7. Despite all the signs and wonders, they witnessed God performed against Egypt. 17, 14, and 12 through 30. Despite watching God destroy the Egyptian army in 14, 26 through 28, and despite the man of God provided in 16, 1 through 15, they still complained to Moses that they had no water to drink. They became so, so distaught, they wondered if God brought them out of slavery in Egypt just to kill them and was to thirst in the wilderness, Exodus 17, 3. God has already performed miracles after miracles in his care and provision for the Israelites. Yet they failed to believe God to provide them with water. How many more signs would they need? What else would God have to do? They expect God to prove himself one more time and provide water. They put God to the test, and they couldn't trust God to provide water in his own way. They filled through natural springs and had a well, but instead they demand God to do the miraculous. They are, are we any different? We should be able to look back over our lives and see God's faithfulness. Time and time again, the Lord has provided for our needs. Amen? He has protected us from harm. He has sustained us from uh, during a dark season. And yet when we face the next crisis, we tempted to put God to the test. We may not say it out loud, but essentially we are saying, prove yourself one more time, God. The command is simple. Don't test, but instead trust. Immediately after the command, he each you shall not tempt the Lord. The Israelites were told that to do is to keep the commandments of the Lord your God. Do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord. God wants to bless us and he wants to bless the Israelites, but we only can experience the blessing as we trust him and obey his word. No test is necessary when we live in obedience to him. How does an obedient faith keep us from testing God? 
you were leading faith that you trust. So I know that we won't test. Okay, Deuteronomy 6, 22-25. And uh, when they when and when the son asked the in the time to come, saying, What being the testimony and the statute and the judgment which the Lord God has commanded you? Then thou should say unto the son, We were Pharaoh's bond on the we were very born in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty, with his, uh, with a mighty hand. Point two, and the Lord showed signs and wonders, great and sore, upon Egypt, upon Pharaoh, and upon all his household before our eyes, and he brought us out from thence, that he might bring us in to give us the land which he spray unto his fathers. And the Lord command us to do these things, statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good, always that we might preserve us alive as it is this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he commanded us. All right, so verse 20, which uh, Moses uh and when the son asked of thee in time to come, saying, What means of testimony and the statutes of judgment which the Lord our God has commanded you? Moses then turned the discussion to a hypothetical time in the future when children who did not experience the law be giving would ask their parents about the meaning of it all. What means the testimony and the statutes and the judgment which the Lord and God has commanded? Notice the twofold implication of the question. First, the children will want to know their heritage. They didn't live through the experience until they would be curious of what it all meant. Second, they may think the law was given just to the parents. But they were for them as well. The children would naturally wonder why they too must obey. Descendants of those who have been taught specific events must be consistently reminded of them, though the faith will pass from one generation to the next. This was especially important for ancient Israel because they had been called to the most important mission of all to be the vessel through which salvation would be brought. To all humanity. Therefore, it was crucial for Israel to reflect on its history and tradition and then to pass their heritage down from one generation to the next. God even specified the manner in which this was to be done. He, de he, de he decreed a sort of sacred storytelling where the answer to the children's question would be recited. In the story form, detailing all the formal, legal, spiritual, and financial aspects. In verse 21 through 23, which says, Then thou should say unto the son, Where the Pharaoh brought men in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand, and the Lord shewed signs and wonders, great and sore, upon Egypt upon Pharaoh and upon his household before our eyes. And he brought us out of thence that he might bring us in to give us the land which is way unto our father. Moses had given a brief outline of what should be included in the story. He began by instructing parents to tell their children about Israel's time in Egypt as slaves and how the Lord delivered them. Next, they were to include stories of how the Lord sent devastating plagues to inflict punishment on Pharaoh and all of his house. Before our eyes was meant to convey the personal eyewitness account of these events. Since the children would have no recognition, recognition, finally parents would tell children about being brought into Canaan and what marvelous place God had prepared for them. This would be equivalent to us telling our children all about family history, especially a part where God works miracles in our lives. In verse 24 and 25, 
And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good always, and he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. And it should be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord God as he has commanded us. For verse 25, next, using the history of Israel, the parents should be specific with their children about stressing the value of keeping the Lord's commandments. The Lord commanded them, commanded them to keep the statute for our good always, and he might preserve us alive. The Lord who gave them the covenant and who had delivered them from Egypt led them into the promised land. Children were to be brought, be taught that the Lord is God worth following, is a God worth following. Moses summed up everything by nothing that faithful compliance to a key of righteousness. In verse 25, he taught the people that they would obtain righteousness in the following the Lord's command. This is not to interfere the covenant keeping on the basis of our own righteousness rather than the expression of our devotion to God. This is a sobering passion, the one that reminds us that parents in particular and the church in general have a vital role in the life of children. They are to be taught that God's law are for their righteousness, always for their good. At its core, this passage works against the danger of prosperity. If a person is not careful, he will begin to absorb many of the world's ideas, namely that we are to look out for ourselves and try to make our own way. And that's anything that anything goes as long as it makes us happy. This ungodly wisdom directly contradicts the lesson Moses was teaching. He urges us to instead to understand and teach subsequently the generation the truth of prosperity comes only when we keep the statutes of God. We're going to go back to the, what the book of the story says. Not only were the Israelites to be faithful and obedient to God, but they were also to teach their children to do the same. They wanted their children to experience God's goodness and faithfulness. They must teach them to keep the covenant. They were to teach them God's word. And this is what Moses had told them earlier. These words I command thee this day that should be in thy heart, and thou shalt teach them generally to unto their children. Deuteronomy 6. Six through seven, but it's not enough for the succeeding generation to know what to do. They need to know that why they doing it. So that's why motiv what motivates the what. Tradition can be a vital part of the Christian faith. The danger is tradition is when we don't think simply because it is tradition, and we lose the meaning of significance of how it becomes a tradition. Right? As one generation hands down truth and practice to the next generation, it is important to also hand down the why and the truth of the pra and practice. We use, we use and hear children ask why. Parents can often feel expert, ex, expert, ex, 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 expert rated, which it seems like that is the only word a preschool and old. We should take advantage of these opportunities to, to teach children, especially when it comes to matter of faith. Moses told the Israelites to take advantage of the moment when the children asked, what means the testimony and statutes and the judgment which the Lord of God has commanded you to return? That's why behind their actions was embedded in their history. The Israelites were to pass on the story the holy his, history of how God has worked on their behalf. The um, successful statement of this statement, redemption history in the verse 21, 24, and the emphasis is not on them, but on God. The Lord brought us out, the Lord shrewd signs and wonders. He brought us out from thence when he had mighty bring us in to give us the land where he swayed unto the fathers, and the Lord commanded us to do all these 
statute. We're not in, we're not Israelites under the old covenant, but we serve the same God. The history is a part of our history. The story of redemption uh, was carried out completely in Christ. God established a new covenant through the blood of his son. One of the glorious promises of the new covenant that Jesus established by his blood is a new heart of God in the Holy Spirit. A new heart also will give you a new spirit that will put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you should keep my judgment and do that. Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27. Jesus died for us and rose again. He forgave us. He gives new life in every step along the way. It is God who took the initiative. How we respond in this great deliverance? The Israelites were to respond to God's work for them with obedience, a fear of submission and trust. And it is safe for us. There is no reason for us to give in to temptation to test God. We will consider all he has done for us through Jesus Christ. We can trust confidently that he takes care of us and his plans are the best for us. We experience God's goodness and faithfulness as we obey his word. Amen. And the question, what are examples of being to God's command producing goodness in your life? And they have an engaged down there uh, to please a statement below regarding different crisis situations and health crisis. So you can do that during the week. Live it out. When you know God and the great salvation He has given you in Christ, you can fully trust Him. He will let you, uh, He will, uh, how will you let His truth impact your life? Confess. There are areas where you live with uncertainty and are tempted to put God to the test. Confess uh, that, confess that as wrong. Acknowledge that you do not need to attempt to force God to act any way you want him to act. Ask God to help you simply trust him. Mm -hmm. Memorize. Choose a verse or two to emphasize the value of trusting God. And memorize that here are two passages to consider. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on unto you thy own understanding and all thy ways and knowledge and that he should direct your path. And that's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And thou will keep it, uh, keep thy path. I mean, thou will keep thy in perfect peace, whose mind stay on thee, because he trusted in thee. Isaiah 26, 3. Those two passages you can remember. A challenge, if you know someone who is pursuing uh, part of God to act in a way that justifies his or her own action. Challenge this person to see why Jesus would put God to the test. Encourage the individual to trust God to work in his own power, way, and time. And then you do this a week. So that's uh, session three. Uh, next week we'll do uh, session four, the temptation. If you face something else before God, the passage will be Deuteronomy 6 10 through 15 and Matthew 4 8 through 11. So that's uh, our word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this lesson day, Lord. We pray for the wisdom and spiritual insight to know your word and to apply it appropriately to our circumstances. We thank you for your word, Lord. And Lord, we trust in you no matter what we go through, Lord. We stay focused on you, Lord, in your ways. We thank you for being our God, Lord. We pray for all those prayer requests that will lift up to you, Lord. We pray that you will be done in the class. Lord, touch them in a special way, those who need your guidance and direction through their lives, Lord, and through the difficulties they go through, Lord. Give them the comfort they need as they face challenges through that. And trust in you, Lord, and bring them through, Lord. And uh, just trust in you no matter what. 
So we praise you and we give you the glory, all this, and we pray in this season, in the mighty name of Jesus, amen. We thank you for joining us today. We pray you have a great week and a blessed week. We'll see you next week.